Cette conférence va maintenant être enregistrée. Bon, bonjour à tous, ici Olivier Talagrand. Vous ne pouvez pas me voir, mais je pense que vous pouvez m'entendre. Le directeur du département, Laurent Bopp, étant empêché, ainsi que Fabien d'Andrea, c'est à moi qu'il vient de présenter Michael Gill, quoique je pense que il n'est pas besoin d'être présenté à beaucoup de ceux qui aujourd'hui. Euh, Michael a eu un parcours assez varié, né à Budapest, il a vécu et travaillé successivement en Roumanie, en Israël, aux États-Unis, et maintenant en France. J'oublie peut-être des étapes, et peut-être, peut-être y en aura-t-il d'autres. Enfin, après avoir fait ses études supérieures au Technion Institute à Haïfa, en Israël, il est parti aux États-Unis où il a fait une thèse au Courant Institute for Mathematical Sciences, New York University, sous la direction de Peter Lacks, un grand nom des mathématiques appliquées. C'est d'ailleurs à ce moment-là que personnellement je l'ai connu. J'ai fait connaissance de Michael il y a déjà un certain nombre d'années en 1973, à une école d'été qui s'est tenue au centre de physique des Zouch sur la mécanique des fluides. Et il s'intéressait déjà à ce moment-là, il s'intéressait déjà à ce moment-là à la dynamique de l'atmosphère. Ensuite, il a appartenu entre différentes institutions à l'Université de Californie à Los Angeles, où il a appartenu au département Department of Atmospheric Sciences, qu'il a présidé pendant plusieurs années. Ses intérêts scientifiques sont extrêmement vastes, euh, mais tous sont plus ou moins directement ou indirectement avec la dynamique de l'atmosphère, la dynamique du climat, en liaison avec la théorie des systèmes dynamiques, euh, la prévisibilité, les bifurcations entre différents régimes, l'assimilation des observations, un ensemble d'intérêts extrêmement vastes. Pour ce qui est de l'école normale supérieure, Michael a commencé à avoir des contacts avec le LMD, je crois, dès les années 1980. Il, fait des, il a fait des visites régulièrement. Il a d'ailleurs accueilli euh, entre-temps à, à UCLA ou euh, à l'Institut for Corinth Institute plusieurs des chercheurs du LMD. Euh, je mentionne Hervé Le Treut, Robert Votard, Bernard Nodra et depuis, il y en a beaucoup d'autres. Enfin, il est venu à l'école normale supérieure sur une position permanente au début des années 2000, euh, où il a été président, je ne l'ai pas dit, il a dirigé pendant plusieurs années, plusieurs années le département des géosciences. Il a aussi été directeur et je crois fondateur du CERTI, du CRS-CRT, le Centre d'enseignement et des recherches sur l'environnement et la société. Et il a actuellement toujours un poste, un poste de professeur émérite à l'école normale supérieure. Bon, Michael a de très nombreuses publications, plusieurs centaines, ce que j'ai vu sur Google Scholar. Il a écrit non seulement des articles, mais des ouvrages. Par exemple, un, Topics in Geophysical Fluid Dynamics, Atmospheric Dynamics, Dynamic Dynamo Theory and Climate Dynamics, qu'il a écrit avec Stephen Childress, il y a plusieurs dizaines d'années, plus d'une dizaine d'années, ou quelque chose comme ça. Je mentionne aussi un article récent de lui, euh, Hilbert Problems for the Geosciences in the 21st Century, qu'il a publié il y a quelques mois, 20 years later, qu'il a publié, publié il y a quelques mois dans le Non-Linear Processes in Geophysics, où Michael, une présentation des problèmes à venir pour le siècle à venir dans, dans tous les aspects des géosciences. Euh, Bon, il a reçu de nombreuses euh, récompenses, deux médailles de, 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 de l'EGU. Euh, je pourrais parler encore longtemps. Euh, je mentionnerai une chose parmi tout ce qu'on peut dire à propos de Michael, c'est qu'il est polyglotte. Et je ne sais pas si les doigts d'une main suffiraient pour euh, compter toutes les langues qu'il parle couramment, peut-être même pas les doigts des deux mains. Enfin, aujourd'hui, il va nous parler en Tipping points across the climate modeling hierarchy. Michael, je coupe mon son et je te laisse la parole. Merci beaucoup, Olivier, pour euh, cette très belle présentation. En effet, euh, c'est une coïncidence amusante que, parce que tu es la première personne de ce labo et donc de ce département 
que j'ai connu lors de cette école d'été euh, en Zouche. On a même co-signé un papier que tu avais plus ou moins écrit euh, tout seul. Euh, enfin, euh, le troisième auteur, David Anderson, euh, qui n'est plus parmi nous, euh, on avait encore fait encore moins que moi. Euh, en tout cas, ce n'est pas le cas de mon très grand nombre de papiers. Euh, donc, euh, il me reste très, entre les difficultés techniques et la très belle présentation, il me reste très peu de temps pour parler de mon sujet. Uh, I actually promise that I will talk in English uh, because there are a number of people who attend this presumably remotely who, uh, whose French isn't too great and furthermore it's going to be faster. Since we have little time, you know, uh, my long experience of these matters indicates that in writing French is about 33% longer than an English, the same English text. And in my speaking, it, it's maybe 50%. So uh, allow me to speak now in English, but of course I'll be pleased to entertain questions in French and uh, respond to them uh, in both languages or whatever. So um, uh, I think in order to read the screen, I will need my glasses. So just a second. Uh, you are going to see the picture with the glasses. Okay. Uh, uh, so, tipping points. Uh, as I said in my abstract, tipping points now are everywhere. But of course, bifurcations have been around since Leonhard Euler. Uh, Leonhard Euler uh, first solved the problem of the buckling of a beam. Usually, ah, here, here's a beam. Okay. So, if you push hard, the beam resists for a while in its symmetric state, cylindrical, symmetrical symmetry about an axis, uh, but at some point it cannot sustain the efforts in normal stresses anymore and it buckles. I'm not going to do that with this beam because it's useful, but that problem was solved about three centuries ago and bifurcations have been around for a very long time. They have been around actually in the climate sciences since the 60s with the pioneering papers of uh, Hank Sommel, Hank Sommel uh, on the thermal halide circulation by, uh, of course, uh, Ed Lorenz on convection and other problems, and by George Veroni for the wind-driven ocean circulation. But uh, bifurcation sounds uh, especially uh, to certain people rather repulsive, it's multi, you know, it's polysyllabic, it's derived from Latin, you don't know exactly what it means. So a big revolution in the field was created by a paper written in 2008 and published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that brought the word tipping points from the social sciences, where it had been introduced by a very successful journalist, Malcolm Gladwell, um, introduced uh, tipping points into the climate sciences. And since uh, everybody has perked up and paid attention, uh, but um, uh, actually uh, some of us have been able to um, identify these as being bifurcations in a new setting, new with respect to what had been done in the climate sciences over the previous decades. So that's the sort of thing that I want to talk about. I want to thank, of course, all my collaborators, and I hope I haven't forgotten too many who have contributed to my interest in this matter for about the last uh, decade and a half, with the first paper published in 2008 and then an important one in 2011. And there have been other groups who have now contributed to this matter in substantial ways, in particular the one of Thomas Steele uh, in Budapest and the one of Peter Ashwin and others in Exeter. Uh, if interested, please visit these sites for more information on the talk and on the publications. So, um, uh, tipping points uh, and climate change. So, uh, actually, these are some lovely pictures. This one is of a rock which is very delicately balanced somewhere in Australia that I owe to Hank Dijkstra. And these are just some cartoons which uh, indicate 
uh, interesting kinds of tipping points. You know, uh, this exercise, uh, which we've probably seen in some some episode of Pirates of the Caribbean, is called in English "walking the plank." You know, if you misbehave on a pirate ship, then uh, you have to sort of be blindfolded and walk along, and you know, for quite a while, depending on how slowly you walk, it's fine. But then at some point, you fall in, and that's the end of it. Uh, so, uh, of course, the power of tipping points is that it makes you think of such terrible stuff. And, of course, uh, it's not unlikely that in our climate future, as in our climate past, such things might occur. So, uh, an important issue is that it is well known from bifurcation theory, and it is true of this generalization that I'll try to introduce to you and show some applications of, the things for quite a while are smooth. For as long as you walk the plank, you know, it looks, each step looks very much like the preceding one. And essentially, bifurcation points are isolated uh, in a precise sense of dynamical system. It's called for generic situations. And it is only these isolated points where bad stuff happens. So you have to deal first with the smooth part and then with the rough part. So again, you know, other examples uh, is just switching on the light, okay? There's a point, you know, for a while it moves and does nothing and then it flips on, and, okay? Boiling water, uh, rioting, which has been a popular topic in another predecessor of uh, tipping points, uh, catastrophe theory. Uh, the mathematical version of which has been largely developed by a French mathematician, René Tom, but popularized by a British one, uh, Zeeman, who applied it to prison riots, revolutions, of course, you know, French, Russian, American, uh, blocking in the atmospheric sciences. Turns out that falling asleep is a tipping point. You might not realize it because you do it every day maybe more than once. Uh, typically, I like to do that in seminars. So please don't right now, wait for a while. Okay, so proceeding along, we're going to be interested in intrinsic versus forced variability, short, intermediate, and long-term prediction, multiple scales of motion, hierarchy of models, which was mentioned in the title on the abstract. And then, of course, we're going to talk about the IPCC, GIEC in French and the uncertainties and how they enter into this picture and then enter into the meat of the subject, time-dependent forcing, and introduce so-called pullback and random attractors and the tipping points thereof. And of the illustrative examples, so the hierarchy of models, I will mention briefly what that is about, but we've been sort of moving across this hierarchy from the Lorentz convection model with stochastic perturbations through the wind-driven oceanic circulation to several El Nino Southern Oscillation or ENSO models with both deterministic and stochastic forcing. And finally, the one uh, that, um, uh, more recent one, a coupled mid-latitude ENSO model. Uh, so I will not have the time to discuss these two intermediate ones, which I've covered in previous talks, but I will go directly from this to that and then conclusions and the list of references. What do we and don't we know? Okay, so this is a lovely view of the climate system as a black box, which is originally due to Jim Hayes, uh, very notable uh, paleoclimatologist at Lamont, uh, at, uh, Columbia University's Lamont Geolo um, Earth Observatory. And uh, I first seen it from Hank Dykstra. I'm sorry, the acknowledgement is covered in the upper right corner by all these other things that are happening. So the idea is that there's some sort of an input, which of course for Jim Hayes was orbital forcing, uh, and then uh, something happens in this box, and what comes out is very, very different. And uh, so if you're interested in first causation in physical sense and then prediction, you somehow have to figure out how this turns into that. And, uh, well, that's largely our job as climate scientists. 
Okay, so um, intrinsic versus force variability. Before that, I uh, wanted to remind you uh, uh, in connection with multiple scales of motion here of uh, essentially uh, the place where the words dynamics and climate, place and time where the words dynamics and climate have been first put together. Before that, which was in the late 50s, before the untimely death of John von Neumann, um, uh, climatology was a part of geography. It was a descriptive science, no dynamics. Although, of course, people like Alexander von Humboldt had pretty good ideas about how dynamics might come in. And so uh, probably most of you uh, here and uh, online uh, participating know that John von Neumann called a number of people, including in particular uh, Jules Charney and Adna Fjotov and some other people, uh, to uh, Princeton's Institute for Advanced Studies to start the first numerical weather prediction um, uh, program uh, as uh, the largest application at the time of computers to civilian uh, problems. But fewer people know that actually uh, he uh, convened also a, um, a meeting on dynamics of climate, which was only edited and published after his death in 1960. This was in 57. And so his introduction to, to this meeting, which again had quite a few important future climatologists or climate scientists, he said something like this, okay, about dynamical systems and prediction. He, of course, was very interested in dynamical systems amongst many other branches of mathematics that he contributed to. Said the initial value problem, in other words, numerical weather prediction, is really the easiest. You know, uh, uh, there are still many things to be done to improve it, and it's really delightful how much it has improved. You know, you just look in the morning at your phone, and it tells you what the time will be uh, next week's Tuesday, and pretty precisely. So it is easiest, okay, because essentially it's been solved. The asymptotic problem, long-term climate, is a little harder. You have to figure out, at least uh, I'm pretty sure that von Neumann thought about it that way, uh, what the particular different asymptotic states might be, of which there can be more than one, as we'll see. But the one that's really hard is intermediate problem. In other words, what's called sometimes low frequency variability, where things like multiple equilibria, long periodic oscillations, intermittency, slow transients, and tipping points uh, intervene. So it's important to know what the initial state is, uh, the, and, or an ensemble of initial states, and what the boundary conditions are, and then you have to fight a little bit with both the intrinsic variability and the force. Okay, so here is, in terms of multiscale, this is a pretty popular picture. It goes back actually to uh, Mary Mitchell in Quaternary Science Review 1976, which coincidentally is the same year in which the same Hasselmann Telus paper appeared. And uh, many people have versions thereof. This is one from an article in an encyclopedia which uh, cuts off the stuff over here, which we know very little about. But my main point about the spectrum is that it, most of the variance, of course, is in the continuous background. <clears throat> there are a few lines. In other words, that's the rotation about, of the Earth around its axis and its harmonics. And this is the revolution around the sun and its harmonics. And then the interesting part is the bumps which are obviously a little bit less predictable than the lines, but more predictable than the continuous background. And the interesting thing is, so my PhD thesis, as Olivier uh, kindly uh, uh, mentioned with Peter Lax, uh, defended in 1976, was exactly or pretty much when this was published. And this is an exact quote from Mary Mitchell's paper which is, says, no known source of deterministic internal variability. Okay, so that's why I'm saying it's important that just coincidentally 
the same, the same year, the Hasselmann paper appeared, which was essentially a vision of the climate system as a linear system with just some random noise. Okay? And I think that in the elapsed years, so four decades and a half, we've gotten a richer view of the, of the matter in which these bumps are associated with intrinsic oscillations, which in turn arise by Hopf bifurcations from stationary states. And you can associate uh, an analysis of time series with a modeling of what gives rise to these various phenomena. Okay, hierarchy of models. So uh, this is just for the, at for the atmosphere. There's a similar diagram like this for the oceans and for coupled systems. And by now we're coupling not just the ocean and the atmosphere, but also the biosphere, the lithosphere, uh, whatever sphere you can grab. So the idea is that essentially as you proceed across the ranks of the hierarchy, so you know here it goes from top to bottom, but you know I tend to think uh, more maybe the opposite way in any case. What you do around here, and there are also diagrams of that sort of thing, you test some ideas and then you move along and you look at them in greater detail in more complete and detailed models, and then, of course, you have to confront them with the observations. Okay? So the point is that this dynamical systems perspective, which was introduced by John von Neumann in the 50s, it takes you in a systematic way through, these, through this hierarchy of models. Okay, so why is anybody paying attention? So again, you know, uh, it's very interesting that um, uh, this uh, review paper that uh, Valerio Lucarini and I published last year in Reviews of Modern Physics, uh, it was mistakenly labeled the first one on climate because actually there was another one in the 80s by Pichotto and Ort, but for a full generation, you know, physicists, I mean, there are many physicists who think they're very smart and therefore they can be smarter than all, anybody who's done climate science before. They have intervened in, in climate sciences and some of them quite constructively, but um, um, the, um, uh, there hasn't been the same sort of attention paid in the scientific world to climate problems and not so much here at Ecole Normale for a while, uh, as uh, is now because uh, the wider public, or at least a large part of it, and even some decision makers have realized that it is important. And the science is fascinating. So, uh, temperature rises, what about impact, how to adapt? Uh, this is my favorite version of this picture, which I'm sure many of you have seen before which is associated with the efforts of the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, yeah, there have been another round of it, but this is very, very clear, because what it says, let's say that we're here, we're more or less able to reproduce what happened over the previous century, although even that is uh, somewhat iffy, but I don't have the time to go into that. But when you go into the future, you have to assume something about what we'll do. I mean, are we going to be terribly wise, okay? Or are we going to be very foolish and continue as we're doing now? And then for each one of these colors, there's about by now two dozen models that participate in these exercises. And each one, up, and each one of these bars essentially gives a very rough estimate of the uncertainty. In other words, it just gives the spread of each separate ensemble for each model of future temperatures. And you can see that this uncertainty is still, you can't see the largest one over here at the end of the century, but uh, for, for the, the red one, but uh, it's still a few degrees. So this has not changed since the pioneering paper uh, of Drew Shiny and Associates produced uh, for the National Academy of Sciences through the National Research Council of the United States, which essentially said for doubling the, the equilibrium, uh, uh, the equilibrium uh, sensitivity 
of the climate system to CO2 doubling is between 1.5 and 4 degrees. Okay? So uh, that was uh, 2.5 uh, degrees, and it's more than 2.5 degrees now. So in some sense, it looks that everything that we've learned, and we've learned a lot, has not reduced these uncertainties about the future very much. And uh, uh, on top of that, these large models used by the IPCC do not do a very good job of reproducing a main source of uncertainty, which is precisely the intrinsic variability. Okay, so um, uh, let's say CO2 doubles. How will climate change? Well, the sort of uh, Charney et al. picture uh, of equilibrium sensitivity is, okay, here is T in uh, the global average, uh, global and annually average mean temperature of surface air, and this is CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, and let's say you double it, well, you know, a scalar linear ordinary differential equation will produce this sort of asymptotic tendency to the new level, and that's all there is. Now, you know, climate is not in equilibrium, never was, never will be, so let's go to the next thing. What if, say, for instance, ENSO were purely periodic as opposed to being irregular? What you would see is still the mean going up. There's no convincing argument that anything else will happen. It's a question about how much, etc. But uh, the amplitude, the period, uh, and, of course, the phase of the oscillation can change. And now what I call here, how about some real stuff? In other words, chaotic plus random. Again, this is essentially out of this um, encyclopedia article. You have some chaotic stuff going on here and some chaotic stuff plus random noise going on there. And there are lots of things, including the distribution of extreme events, which are going to change. So that's really, we want to make some progress in going from this to that. Okay, so how do you deal in a systematic way with time-dependent forcing? Uh, let me just show you the simplest kind of climate model that, uh, you know, goes back to the late 60s, a so-called energy balance model in which uh, you have a symmetry about uh, the axis of rotation and you have a piece of atmosphere and some ocean like that going around the be latitude belt and you have incoming radiation and outgoing radiation, and you have exchanges between such belts, okay? So what that will, the big surprise, um, the surprise has been built over a number of years since the pioneering papers of Budik and Sellers published in 68 and 69 to the middle of the 70s when a number of people did analysis like this, but this is sort of the one that most clearly associates uh, bifurcation points of a type that we know, in other words, saddle node bifurcation, what's going on. So this is a parameter which you can think of as being the fractional change in uh, insulation at the top of the atmosphere, and that's the famous uh, global mean temperature that I was mentioning. So we are sitting up here on this stable branch, which looks like the present climate. You know, mu equal one is down here. And at the time, actually, although Olivier uh, disputes that, uh, the main worry was that what we discovered was uh, this bifurcation point, you know, remember the guy who was walking the plank and falling down into what we called at the time a deep freeze, but in the meantime geochemists discovered was indeed a snowball earth, and then in order to come back you have to increase mu quite a bit, okay? So uh, this is a bifurcation point old-fashioned style. So while you're walking along this plank, along this branch, everything is smooth, but then you come to something here and uh, all hell breaks loose. Uh, and now we're talking not so much about this, but we're talking about other such bifurcations that might occur as you increase um, uh, this parameter. Okay, so this picture 
of the double well potential of bistability. You can find it in that review paper. You can find it in many other places. Um, you uh, basically you have some sort of a potential uh, that has two minima. One is the snowball, the other one is the warm one, the current climate, and in between there's an unstable one. And actually, this is a very general situation for every type of system, including partial differential equations and other infinite dimensional systems like functional differential equations. As long as it is a so-called gradient system in which you can find the right-hand side by differentiating a scalar, you have what's called a saddle point in between, which uh, uh, corresponds to what's called in mathematics the mountain uh, pass lemma. You know, if you have two villages in one valley and the next one, there's some point that is the one where you can most easily go from the one to the other. Okay? So this is a general. Now the other thing that, uh, again, that is only indicated by some arrows here that you fall off here and then you have to go all the way here to come back is what's called the hysteresis. And this is out of a book that's called uh, Galileo Unbound about the evolution of dynamics from the times of Galileo Galilei to Newton and so on to the present. And it shows a full such hysteresis cycle in a totally different situation. It happens in biology and in mineral physics in lots of places. Okay, so um, now that was what we did for a number of decades in what some of us did in the climate sciences, starting from the early 60s into the 2000s, okay? And it's uh, sort of in the middle of the, of the first decade of the century that some of us realized that it doesn't match what we are really worried about today. In other words, how does that forcing, whichever way you might model it in, uh, in this picture, how does that interact not with a fixed point as in this picture, but with an active climate system like this picture? Okay, so in order to do that, you have to understand, first of all, you have to define what an asymptotic situation is. Okay, so let's look at this very simple scalar linear ODE, x dot equal to minus alpha x alpha positive plus sigma t sigma positive. And let's say, well, if sigma is zero, we know very well that this decays to zero. But what if it does not? So let's say that you are, this is the present, okay? And you want to define what it, the asymptotic state of your system is. It's not clear at all, but it turns out that the right thing to do is to pull back, okay, to some compact set from which you launch a flow point, okay, which converge, okay, to this straight line, okay? And the further you pull back, the closer you are to the straight line at a certain point. So this is a simplest situation for just this scalar linear ODE. It turns out that it can be defined for things that are chaotic and where this forcing term is not just deterministic, but it is stochastic. And again, I don't have the time to go into the details of that, but I will show you some of the examples. So I promise to you the tipping points, aside from being a battle cry, are also something well-defined mathematically by now. So the standard quote for this is a paper of Peter Ashwin and colleagues at Exeter and elsewhere, published in the uh, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society Series A in 2000. Oops, uh, sorry, there's an extra zero here. Uh, it's uh, 2012. Uh, so... Um, Essentially, this describes how the forcing interacts with the behavior of the system. So you have a bifurcation due or induced tipping in which a slow change in a parameter leads to the system passage through a classical bifurcation. 
So this would be something in which you describe how you move. In other words, let's say that this mu changes slowly. You have to define precisely what slowly is. Slowly means slower than the attraction to this solution branch. So it changes slowly, and then what it does in the neighborhood of the classical bifurcation point, okay? And so you can see that uh, there can be things that are a little bit more complicated than in the, in the model that I showed you, okay? And then there's what's called, this is, was also in some sense known before, but noise tipping or uh, noise-induced tipping in which random fluctuations lead to the system's crossing and attract the basin boundary. So it is something like this where you have uh, some noise. Well, let's say we're here, you have some noise, and at some point you spill over this unstable fixed point in the scalar case or mountain pass in the more general case, okay? So uh, that's noise-induced tipping, and then there's one that's more exotic, which is R-tipping or rate-induced tipping, which rapid changes lead to the system's losing track of a slow change in its attractors. So somehow, instead of just moving this, you know, pulling the two branches of this double well up and down slowly, you do something, the attractor is more complicated, and it loses track and it goes off to somewhere where it wouldn't have gone if you did things slowly. Okay, so illustrative examples. Okay, yeah. it actually works. Uh, okay, so as I said, I will briefly go uh, through the Lorentz convection model, although I won't show you the very sexy video thereof, but go to the appropriate sources that I gave you, and you can find it. And then I will have to skip the wind-driven oceanic circulation, although there are some beautiful results, and several results obtained with ENSO models with deterministic and stochastic forcing, and go on to some very recent work. We just essentially submitted it, uh, I think, on Saturday, and uh, we just got the archive number today, so you, know, uh, you can find it. Okay, so just in case somebody doesn't remember what we're talking about when we say the Lorentz convection model, I uh, insist here there's an A because the same year he published another very interesting paper on the mechanics of vacillation in the same journal, which uh, has other types of bifurcations. So the model equations are just three ODEs, and uh, they are so-called conservative nonlinearities. Uh, in other words, if there were no uh, diffusion, um, uh, the energy would be conserved, but there is, so things go to the dissipation and uh, things go to a strange attractor. Okay? So you've all seen this. You can find any number of pictures like this on the web. And then what uh, we did, so this is uh, work with Mikhail Shekrun and Eric Simonet in 2011. We added, so what you see here, you add to each one of those equations. So this is a nonlinear thing that you found that, okay, it's this stuff that I showed you here for each one of these equations. And just then you add so-called multiplicative noise. So this is a Wiener process or uh, uh, Brownian motion. Uh, if you are more familiar with that, and there is the variable which sits here, which multiplies that noise, and then there's also a parameter which indicates the amplitude. So the results here are not perturbative results, as in more classical mathematical physics. They are large perturbations. And so this is the projection of the so-called sample measure, if you wish, the PDF, if you did, if you want to think about it in a very simple way, okay, you think of starting your ensemble over here, okay, and then just counting particles as you move along, okay? And um, so what you see is, uh, so the larger densities are here and the smaller densities are there going into no density. 
Okay? So you still see the origin, so it's a projection of that onto the XZ plane. You still see the origin, which is singular, and you see the two so-called convective points around which you have a Hopf bifurcation, and then you see all the orbits which weave between the two wings of the butterfly. Okay? Another more detailed picture is this, so it's not the same colors and it's not the same uh, ratio of the projection, but you still see the deterministic dynamics, you know, you come down here to the origin and you go either way on one of the, oops, on one of the wings, and then you come back to the same wing or go over to the other one, but there's a lot of other stuff that is happening here, which is the interaction of the noise with the deterministic dynamics, okay? So these are just four snapshots. So the snapshots are these points at which you are looking at the attractor, okay? So, oops, sorry. The snapshots would be here and here and here. There's in, in, here, in each case, you would just see a point. But what you see for this much more complicated beast is one of these things which are illustrated here, okay? So uh, you see that there are holes that form, and there are all sorts of interesting things that are happening. And now you can talk about climate sensitivity not just as being the change in the mean, but also in the second and higher moments in the distribution of extremes. She actually thinks that there's an artesian fountain, there's parts of the measure that are spewed up of this churning stuff. So, uh, sorry. Uh, I, as I said, I'm skipping now other stuff that I used to present in other meetings and going directly to this much more uh, complicated climate model that includes both ocean and atmosphere and now also the tropics as well as the extratropics. So it is the, uh, the classical uh, so-called autonomous version in which there's no time-dependent forcing, was published in 2015 in Physica D, and uh, so these, these were the authors, and uh, the current paper with the time-dependent forcing is the same authors except no longer lessly included among them. So we refer to this classical, you know, uh, autonomous version as the VDDG model, okay? So what, what was done here? We have, uh, again, discretization as was Ala uh, uh, Galyorkin, as was developed in the early 60s by Platzmann and Lorentz and by other people. You project the partial differential equations into some basis functions. In this case, there's rectangular geometry, so there are Fourier modes. So you have 20 atmospheric variables and 16 uh, oceanic ones, a total of 36 modes. So this is not three and not four as it was in some of the uh, ocean circulation work, it's 36. And Hopf bifurcation leads to bidecadal orbit. So uh, the, um, the low frequency variability is really low, it's multi-decadal, it's much longer than the characteristic time of the eddies in either atmosphere or even the ocean. In other words, uh, essentially uh, based on characteristic time of evolution of paraclinic instabilities. So this orbit gives rise in turn to a strange attractor. So here you see these, uh, you see these orbits that are projected onto, um, uh, this is the leading Fourier component of the oceanic model of the stream function, and this is the temperature uh, that goes with that. And you see that they are essentially periodic orbits which start to develop kinks like, uh, you know, when you get to the end of the plank. And there's also a separate attractor which is separate from this stuff. So this subspace, this slow subspace in the strange attractor involves both atmospheric and oceanic modes. So there's a general conception that the atmosphere is faster than the ocean and if the slow stuff is in the ocean, here there are modes which are truly coupled modes. And uh, Stefan van Nietzsche and myself examined this with reanalysis data in a subsequent paper in 2017 in GRL, and there does seem to be evidence for such truly coupled modes with low frequencies in, in the reanalysis. 
uh, then as forcing increases or damping decreases, the dimension of the attractor increases and it gets noisier. Okay, so um, uh, for certain parameter values, in other words, for high forcing or low damping, solutions are chaotic. So you see here uh, geopotential height difference. In, okay, uh, one of the variables. Uh, you see that it's chaotic because there's no exact recurrence, but it's pretty smooth. And for other, okay, so this was, sorry, this was for low forcing or high damping, and this now is for high forcing or low damping. Other parameter fluctuations are rapid and large. Solutions lie far from a slow attractor. The atmospheric predictability is low. So now the next thing that we just did and about which I just wanted to tell you rather briefly, we started a little late, so I'm still uh, within time, uh, is where uh, now this VDDG model is forced with uh, tropical forcing. Uh, there is a, an underlying uh, model that is essentially Fifth Gin and Associates uh, recharge model, which produces solutions like this or like that. So these are actually perfectly periodic in spite of the fact that also there is some apparent irregularity. And these, uh, this solution is chaotic. You see that the intervals between these bursts uh, are rather irregular, okay? So, and the periodicity in this case, I mean, the mean period is much longer. This this axis is 120 years, and this axis from 300 to 600 is 300 years, okay? So we now study the pullback attractor. So that thing, which in a very simple example was just a straight line, okay? We study the pullback attractors of the VDDG model subject to the ends of forcing, and the main result is the coexistence of two local partial uh, uh, pullback uh, attractors. Now, uh, I have to explain to you what a global attractor is. So, let's see. Ah, I saw that there was some chalk here. Okay. So, basically, in the classical autonomous case, for instance, a global attractor, well, the ones that you are used to are just fixed points. You know, a fixed point which has everything flowing into it. Okay. But uh, what we're talking about here, when we say a global attractor, is that you have one such fixed point, which is phasor, and another one, which is unstable phase. In between of the two, you have what's called a heteroclinic orbit. You see, there are some directions in which this thing is unstable and other stable, okay? So you can get out of here, and you get into this one, which is stable every which way. And this whole thing is a global attractor. If the system is dissipative, okay, and you start somewhere in the far past, you are going to end up on this, okay? It's, uh, you know, if in that sense, there's no difference made between the two fixed points. So in one of those papers uh, where uh, we notice these two local, numerically, these two local uh, pullback attractors um, with very distinct stability properties. So this is Stefano Pierini, and the third author is Michael Schekun. And he, of course, uh, did the heavy lifting on the, on the rigorously mathematical work. That system is a little bit like the Lorentz system that I showed you. In other words, there's some conservative nonlinearity and some linear dissipativity, and that dissipativity helps you to have such an object that is a unique global attractor, but within which you can have two local pullback attractors. Okay? So just a couple of snapshots, uh, of, uh, sorry, snapshots in the pictures out of the results here. So this is in the case of periodic ends of forcing. So the ends of forcing looks like this. That's, oops, uh, that's essentially repeated here. And here are uh, the two colors are, so 
So the two uh, pullback attractors, we can compute their Lyapunov exponent still in this non-autonomous case. And you see that the Lyapunov exponent of D1, the red one, is about twice. This is about 0.1 and this is about 0.2, never mind the units. D1 is twice as unstable as the other one. And so the color is preserved. You always see red is this one, okay, and blue is the other one. And here you don't see such a big difference, but in this one you do see a pretty big difference. So interestingly, it is actually the less uh, unstable one, or the more, more uh, sorry, the, the less stable one, the more unstable one, which has lower amplitude oscillations, but they are more irregular. Okay, so the behavior is quite different, and again, here, part of the stuff is, is covered up by uh, things about the call, but essentially what you see is for um, uh, the actual snapshots, in other words, you know, those sections that I showed you, for the uh, uh, PBA1 in yellow and the PBA2 in purple. So you see that both the um, uh, place in phase space that is occupied by the two, uh, they look interwoven because this is just a projection, okay? They are, in fact, separate, okay? So, um, although they have obviously complicated boundaries with respect to each other, but uh, both the distribution and the extent is different. So now, in addition, and uh, here I'm, um, I'm uh, this is the last slide that I'll show you of the behavior of the model and I'll go on to the conclusions. Okay, what's plotted here is a leading Lyapunov exponent, sigma one, okay, as a function of the ENSO forcing parameter. So this parameter G just tells you how strong the forcing is. It doesn't tell you, you know, whether it's uh, uh, periodic or chaotic, but it is a chaotic case. And there's another important parameter. We had seen that, of course, already in the, in the paper from uh, uh, 2015 on the, on the autonomous case, that, of course, the coupling intensity between the atmosphere and the ocean changes the behavior. Okay? So what you see here is a function of the, is the, Lyapunov, the leading Lyapunov exponent as a function of this forcing parameter G. And what you see is that there seems to be a jump here. Okay, so again, there appear to be these two pullback attractors. And the reason that you find points in between is because of the long transients. So these are pretty long solutions, 3,000 years, but you still see transients. And in this interval, clearly, the two PBAs coexist. Okay, I say clearly because there's numerical, strong numerical evidence, there's no proof for now. They say the situation has been explored more thoroughly in the wind wave and ocean circulation model. In the present case, the two PBAs, which wasn't the case in, in, in the work in the uh, wind wave and ocean case, the two PBAs leak trajectories. I don't have the slide here, but you can see uh, the picture in the paper, through their basin boundaries, leading to even larger predictive uncertainties over the um, decade of time scales. So, you know, this says very clearly that, let's say, uh, aside from a battle cry, uh, tipping points uh, can very well be in our future, okay? So, Conclusions and references, what do we and don't we know? Well, there are great uncertainties in climate sensitivity and predictions. Those that you typically read about in the uh, reports and even summaries for policymakers of the IPCC have a lot to do with particular climate feedbacks like cloud radiation feedback and so on. But that is because these large models that the IPCC mostly relies upon do not capture the intrinsic variability very well. Okay? So, uh, I don't even know what it says here. Some uh, are, okay. 
The climate system is open and affected by time-dependent forcing, so, you know, the treatment as, a, as being autonomous, uh, in spite of the, in, essentially, in discussing predictability for numerical weather prediction, in spite of the fact that we have a diurnal cycle and we have all the noise and cloud ensembles and so on, is justified because we are still making pretty good predictions. But it is really not the right uh, framework for discussing climate change. So the affected by time-dependent forcing, both deterministic and stochastic. You can think, if you will, of anthropogenic effect as being deterministic or at least pretty smooth from one year to the next, and volcanic eruptions or other such things as, well, uh, sub-grid sub scale, turbulence, and uh, microphysics and so on in clouds as being stochastic effects. So there is a general, nice general framework for including time-dependent forcing non-autonomous non and random dynamic systems. What do we know as well? Well, how does the climate system really work? You know, we know that it's gonna get warm, but we don't really know, you know, my, one of my favorite uh, examples from that is, although some oceanographers don't like it, is that it's not really known why what used to be called the thermohaline circulation and what is now called more the meridional overturning circulation because wind also contributes to make it overturn. What really drives the meridional overturning circulation because you know there's a very, very small difference between very, very large forces. And one of those things that are about the size of that difference are actually giant squid. This is not a joke. You know, there's serious published work which indicates that biomass in general contributes to this meridional overturning, and in particular, you know, there are enough giant squid and they wave enough to be within the order of magnitude of those large, the difference between those large forces. So smooth and rough dependence, you know, tipping points, the other things, and tipping points are so-called crises, one of those entomologies we illustrated, such a thing, we don't have the time to go into it. So how do the latter affect the intrinsic variability, so not just in the mean, but higher moments, extreme events, etc. What to do, work the model hierarchy and the observations, of course, and explore further non-autonomous and randomly driven models and their particular. So here are some general references, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. You know, I thought in advance when, you know, when, when uh, Elaine let me know that there's now this restriction of what it must be for actors, musicians, and so on. This year, you know, it's now a full year that we haven't seen. Uh, we've had some marvelous uh, operas and uh, ballets on TV, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it, it must be terrible if your job is really, those are our job is to do the science as well as talk about it. But <laughs> their job is really to show it. So thanks for being here and I'll be happy to entertain some questions if and then we'll let you. Okay, thank you, Mikhail. So, are there questions? I think you can actually ask them early, and, let's, and there may be a chat in which you can write your questions. Okay, questions? You can ask your questions. He can speak. He can hear you. Uh, please, for the other, I know that this is Olivier because I've known his voice, as I said, for a very long time. But uh, further questions, please identify yourself. Because yeah. <laughs> it makes it more interesting. You can turn on your, your camera. Yeah, you can turn on your camera. Yeah, you can turn Um, 
Bon, bah, je vais poser une question, c'est Bernard. Euh, J'avais levé la main, mais visiblement, ça n'est pas vu. Donc, euh, moi, j'ai une question un peu générale. Euh, et, bon, ces modèles qui donnent des comportements euh, assez, euh, assez extraordinaires bon, restent néanmoins d'une simplicité énorme par rapport à aux modélisations qui sont actuellement utilisées pour le climat. Et je n'ai pas l'impression que l'écart que aille en diminuant euh, avec le temps. D'un côté, on, on, on fait toujours des travaux sur des modèles de Lorentz ou des choses un peu similaires aux modèles de Lorentz. Et de l'autre côté, on voit bien que les modèles de climat incorporent des processus de plus en plus nombreux, euh, des processus végétaux maintenant. Des, bon, il y a la chimie, il y a plein de choses qui sont qui apparaissent, qui ouvrent quand même euh, la voie dans un espace des phases euh, aussi énorme à des tas de chemins pour euh, s'échapper des, des attracteurs qui n'existent pas dans ces modélisations euh, simplifiées. Donc la question, c'est de savoir euh, quel est le programme pour euh, essayer de faire le lien, euh, pour démontrer que ce qu'on observe effectivement dans ces modèles euh, très simples, ces comportements dynamiques très riches, sont effectivement pertinents dans les modèles plus compliqués ou, euh, disons, quelles sont les, les, les façons qu'on pourrait euh, utiliser pour détecter des tipping points dans les modèles euh, complexes. Si on n'en est pas capable, si on n'est pas capable d'étudier leur dynamique dans les fa de façon euh, aussi approfondie, on devrait peut-être pouvoir au moins avoir des indications sur comment détecter des tipping points et conduire des expériences numériques éventuellement euh, dans ce sens. Merci Bernard pour avoir posé euh, la, la question qui s'impose, évidemment. Euh, donc, euh, bon, je vais, je vais quand même revenir à l'anglais pour ceux qui... Euh, euh, so, the question was about uh, how can we extend such studies to really uh, heavy-duty so-called IPCC class models? Well, as I mentioned, the first thing about the IPCC class models is that they have many details, but they don't have fundamental features of the variability. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, it's been demonstrated by Hank Dijkstra that uh, in this issue of uh, the uh, particular Atlantic uh, meridional overturning circulation, uh, the issue of the import and export of salinity uh, within a certain box was badly done in the large models, not in the small ones. So, you know, the classical thing is, don't bother us, go away with your sophisticated mathematics. We can make these things turn on big computers and write many papers out of that and uh, talk about tipping points. So uh, more seriously, uh, so there's, you know, the, the, uh, the fight is going on. But more seriously, um, there are many ways of empirical model reduction. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the devil is in the details. Uh, as Disney and other people famously said. Um, but um, there are some fundamental things that can be capture, captured by uh, empirical model reduction. And uh, we have done such things. Uh, a particular class of models that uh, has been introduced by Sergei Kaftsov when he was still in my research group at UCLA and uh, that he's continued since. He's now a full professor and a very creative uh, independent researcher at uh, the University of Wisconsin uh, and uh, that have uh, more recently um, in another paper with uh, Uh, Mikhail Shekrun and, uh, and Dmitry Kondrashov uh, in Physica D, we've shown that uh, the reason that these, uh, this class of empirical model, EMR models, work so well it is because there's an intimate connection with uh, Moritz Zwanzig reduction, which, as proposed by Moritz Zwanzig, um, is not really computable, 
but uh, there are various ways of making it computable, and one of them is precisely this approach, which was not obtained by deriving it from the physical principle, but essentially just intuitively, but shown to work very well. And more recently, uh, of course, uh, you know, there's a big fashion of machine learning, deep learning, etc., which is uh, increasingly being applied to the climate sciences. And uh, uh, there's something in particular that it's called VAE, Variational Autoencoding and Decoding, which seems to hold the promise not just to do it, which is the case in many ML applications that are static, classification, etc., but for dynamic problems, and uh, I'm impatient to see this uh, done in uh, more in practice. And, uh, you know, we're trying to get some support for that uh, uh, from various sources. So the answer is there is a way, hopefully, but it has to be walked. It's, uh, it's open, but uh, it's not done. Olivier? Oui, j'ai pas un instant euh, de question. Oui, tu avais, tu avais commencé à poser une question, mais il y a eu des difficultés techniques. Tu, non, tu non, non, il y a des malentendus. Je n'avais pas commencé à poser. J'avais simplement fait un commentaire général appelant aux questions. Ah, d'accord. D'accord. Merci encore. OK. So. No other hands raised. So again, you can uh, you can look the stuff up. Uh, in particular, the latest ver work is uh, should be on archive. I couldn't put uh, I couldn't put the number because I didn't have it uh, yesterday. It's been uh, it's been provided today. But if you search for the title or for the authors on Archive, you are going to find it. And then here are uh, two of the papers that uh, Olivier mentioned and uh, some other stuff uh, that we're doing with uh, these random dynamical systems with uh, a team uh, in Buenos Aires and still with Mikael. And uh, there, there is another recent paper with Stefano Pierini submitted to scientific reports, which uh, got some pretty favorable reviews and which we just resubmitted. So I haven't included it yet in this list. Merci beaucoup. Volontiers. Merci beaucoup et à merci à vous. Merci à vous.